And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Reconciled invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconciled.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Richard Parker. He's the CEO of richardparker.com and at Roy Street Advisors. You've been in this business, what, 30 plus years? 30 so plus I'm, years, yep. Yeah, man, I'm really looking forward. You work with some big name clients and stuff. Really looking forward to getting to know you getting to learn from you, learn from your experiences, from your mistakes, from other people's mistakes that have been done in your presence, and really share that with the audience. So thank you for being here today. Well, it's my pleasure. I've listened to a number of your podcasts. I think you do great work. Most of, your guests, most of them, if not all, are very entertaining. Clearly <laughs> learn something pretty much with every podcast, and I'm glad you're going to touch on some of the mistakes that I've made because I made a hell of a lot of those. It's been a good learning experience. So I'm happy to share anything and everything I can and hopefully provide some good knowledge and learning to your audience. Awesome. I always say I make good money on my wins and I make a lot of it, get a lot of education from my losses, right? Absolutely. 100%. It's all my reality. And sometimes you end up more educated than you are wealthy. So <laughs> my, my joke, my running joke is you were born and now you ended up on a show about mergers and acquisitions. Could you fill out the gap in between? You've been doing this for 30 years. So can you give us a kind of, how did you get into this space? And then uh, give us a rundown of what the last 30 years in the mergers and acquisitions looks for you. What I'm looking for is a way for the audience to connect with you, know who you are, and build that trust in you before we tell, give your advice. Because a lot of people that are listening know who you are. The cool thing is I was on a, a meeting this morning with like a virtual summit with a bunch of speakers and stuff. And they asked me who I was interviewing today. And I gave them your name and another guy's name. They knew them both. They just knew who you were. So that's a good sign. And these guys were over in the UK. So, so it's, yeah, we have well, a lot of clients in the UK. I'm happy to give you some background. I'm not surprised that you, that there was familiarity with me. I'm trying to fly under the radar and have for many years. So I've been in the M&A world pretty much since 1990. And I got into it by accident. I was 29 years old and working. I was living in Canada. I grew up in Canada, in Montreal. So you can see by my Montreal Canadiens jersey. So I grew up in Canada. I was working for a consumer products and toy company. They were a publicly traded company, a lot of popular products. As 29 years old, I was running a division for them. I had a terrific job. The company was growing by leaps and bounds. So I grew within the company probably much quicker than I should have under normal circumstances, but the company was doing really well. I was working like a maniac and they were terrific at promoting from within. The age didn't matter if you were working hard, reasonably intelligent and loyal and focused on customers, you can advance pretty quickly. And I was making a real good living. I was making $72,000 a year. This was in 1989. I was 29 years old and I discovered the stock market and I pissed away $60,000 in the stock market when someone told me the wonderful world of buying stock on margin that actually shit the bed. And so I found myself making 72 grand, lost 60. My first kid was on the way. As I thought about it was, there's just no way I'm getting out of this hole if I keep working for somebody, which is absolutely not going to happen. And as it turned out, the division that I was running got sold back to Hasbro. We were under license for a product category it's called Play School Baby, which were instant products, toys, squeeze toys, bibs, pacifiers, etc. And they acquired back the license from us at that point. They wanted me to run the division. I wanted to go on, onto my own and I'd made that decision before. And so I struck a deal with them, which was terrific for both sides, which was 
they have to train their a new general manager or managing director or CEO, whatever you want to call it, to run the business. And I agree to train that individual and train their anybody else in their company in exchange for getting the rights to that product for Eastern Canada. So that worked out well. So I opened up basically a manufacturer's rep business. And that was in 1990. And shortly thereafter, I was doing okay because I had a platform to make some money as we can do okay living and started to look at some other companies that would dovetail well into what I was doing that I could acquire. And I started making some acquisitions. And along the way, I guess I started getting a bit of a reputation for buying some of these smaller companies, mostly amongst friends, family, and colleagues, because we're all pretty young guys, and started helping some of those individuals acquire some companies. And I continued to acquire some businesses. I acquired a a retail merchandising company. I was selling into retailers and what was happening is I kept going into these stores and I had sold them all these goods and finding out my goods are in the back room and not being put out onto the sales floor just because they were too busy or short staffed. So I started a retail merchandising company and then in one local area and started buying up a bunch of similar companies that were already operational in, in that business. One of them at that point was a hundred thousand dollar acquisition, which I could not afford. And I managed to work out a deal with the, with the owner of that business where I would acquire it for very little money up front and bring him into the business and his operation into the business and give him a piece of the bigger pie. And lo and behold, we turned that shitty little business into a four and a half million dollar business and immensely profitable and started making some other acquisitions. And then in 1992, 93, through that retail merchandising company, actually, a friend of mine was trying to acquire the line for Save a Video. Well, I'm not sure how old you are, but I'm old enough and they used to have the video. But at that time, Nintendo had 80% of the market. Sega had 20, but Nintendo's was much infinitely more popular. A friend of mine was trying to get the line for Canada and become the CEO. He was pitching Sega because the current distributor wasn't doing a real good job. But he needed this study done because he, he wanted to make sure he went to them with a proper assessment of what was in the stores across Canada. And I had this retail merchandising company. It was a buddy of mine. So I said, hey, I'll do the whole study for you. I had 200 employees visiting thousands of stores across Canada. So I said, tell me everything you need to know. I'll get all the answers from every store, every nook and cranny in, in Canada. And you can build that into your presentation to Sega that we were, they were in Redwood City, California. And so I said, I'll do it for you and I'll flip the whole bill. He was a buddy of mine. So I yeah. said, I'll flip the whole bill. And if by chance you get the line, I want it for Eastern Canada. I didn't really even know what Sega was, but my buddy was a pretty successful guy, more an executive position. And so I said, hey, so we had this uh, sort of very casual agreement, but the key thing for me is I just want to help him. So lo and behold, a number of months later, he calls me one day. I was actually vacationing in Florida at the time. He said, hey, I got the Sega line. Then I said, like, I didn't even remember. Right. He said, we got to be in Las Vegas next week. And I was on vacation. I said, okay. So I dropped on his door, he went to Vegas. You know, keep in mind my business at that point in time, because it was mostly the, it was some retail merchandising and the consumer products. I was doing two and a half million dollars a year of successful. I got to single line. My business went to $30 million in a year. Just at the time when Sega spent like $300 million in advertising and that market share of 80, 20 that Nintendo had flipped Genesis and Game Gear and some other virtual reality product. And so the whole market shift. So my business went through the roof, nothing to do with me. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. In short order, I was making more money than all the senior executives at Sega. I knew that would happen. It typically happens in those situations. If something, if a product gets on fire. So I knew they'd buy me out. I sold for that in the contract that they could never convert any of my accounts. And they bought me out and it was, uh, it was very profitable. And I was deciding at that point, whether or not I was going to move to Toronto, move to Florida, we ended up relocating to Florida. What, what year was that? That was in 1996. So we probably drove past each other on a regular basis. I got out of the military in 97. Hawaii was my last duty station. Got out three and a half years in Oahu, horrible duty station. <laughs> but night diving in the ocean during the day, going to college and then working a military intelligence job. When I, I lived in that area and actually lived and worked in Redwood City, but that would have been 2000, around 2000. So anyway, let's jump back into, so now we're in the nineties and uh, you were involved in Sega Genesis. Let's continue the story. And it's very fascinating. Okay, cool. So after Sega bought me out, I was deciding whether or not I wanted to move out of Montreal, the political situation that's going on there since 1976 at young kids. And uh, it was a significant change in my business. And so 
but deciding whether or not I was going to move to Toronto, which is where all the head offices typically were located. If I want to continue seeing my business, I was considering moving to Burlington, Vermont, which is an hour and a half from Montreal. It's a nice college town. I can do a lot of river fishing. So my kids were young in the political situation. And they said, you know what, what the heck, once I move, I'm going to move somewhere warm. So I moved down to Florida and was thinking about what I was going to do. I got involved as a CEO in a, in a golf business with Greg Norman. It was a public company and ran that for a few years. It was one of those companies where we had a phenomenal product, but we couldn't turn it into a terrific business. And then I left there and said, I'm getting back into the acquisition mode. And between that period, I just threw the chilling out a little bit. So got back into acquisition mode. I was looking to make acquisitions and I got involved with one in South Florida. It was a distribution business of commercial washers and dryers, catering mostly to laundromats and all dormitories and where you have the coin operated units in, in certain facilities. And I was very close to making the acquisition. It wasn't a big acquisition. It was a little over a million dollars. The deal terms were pretty good and negotiated that. As I was going into the due diligence and really investigating it thoroughly, I soon discovered that the whole business was a house of cards. Oh. I mean, there was a lot, a lot of co-mingling. It was the proverbial, any individual worried about buyers, sellers cooking the books. I mean, this was it. And not so much fraudulent really, but from a standpoint of co-mingling, the owner had one company that he owned a lot of these machines and he was moving revenue from one to the other. The bookkeeping really wasn't accurate and it was just a real mess. And so I decided to rescind my offer and it was really an important day in my life because I walked out of that building. It was in Broward County, or just off Broward Boulevard in Broward County, Florida, which is really Fort Lauderdale area. And I was standing, I walked out into the parking lot of this building. I just informed the seller that I was not going through with the transaction. And I remember standing in the parking lot and thinking to myself, said, the average schmuck would have bought that business. The only reason thing that saved me was not because I'm that smart, it's but I've done it a bunch of times. I knew what to look for and what to dig in and what were the red flags and what, what should set off the alarm bells. But the average person wouldn't have, would have bought that business unquestionably. And so it really triggered in me a high level of curiosity about what's out there for small business buyers to assist them with the process of acquiring a business. And the internet was just really starting to take hold. It was 2000, late 2000, I'd gone through the bubble and at the beginning, everything on the internet was free. And I always thought the internet was pretty cool, but there's no way I was ever going to get involved in the internet, sell it, getting involved in anything that's for free. I mean, that didn't make any business sense. And so I spent an inordinate amount of time researching what an individual business buyer is faced with or does, or what resources or good help is available to them. And at every turn, I found the answer was nothing valuable. And there was just all this stuff and information. Accountants really weren't the right people. To, they were good for due diligence, but not for valuation. Lawyers, they're not deal makers. They write up the documents. At every turn, there was nothing available. They said, I looked at hundreds and hundreds of businesses in my life to potentially acquire, and I kept immaculate files. And I always kept tremendous records related to on any scenario that came up and something that went wrong, what I did or what happened, whether it was a good thing or a mistake. And clearly you learn a lot more from your mistakes, but I had these files like this, like of tons of great stuff. Right. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to memorialize all this. I'm going to put my life's work at that point into material that's going to walk someone right through the whole process of buying business, not only what they need to know what they need to do and how to do it. Because of, while I was doing all of my research, I was finding out and speaking to a lot of business buyers, they go about it the complete wrong way. They just jump into it and start looking at businesses for sale, rarely with any preparation. And the statistics I was finding according to industry resources was over 90% of the people who begin to search to buy a business, never get to the finish line or close a transaction. And so I put everything together that I wanted. And I had, again, these great files. So it was very organized. I just wanted to get everything out there and the night before, I had a website developed and the night before we hit the push button on the website, my wife said to me, how many think you're going to sell? And I said, I really don't care. But if I'm happy, if I sell one of these and it either helps someone buy the right business or helps them avoid buying the wrong one, it'll have been worth all the effort possible. So I had no delusions whatsoever that this was turning, going to turn into a business. I just wanted to help people because I'd gone through this and I didn't want to see people make mistakes. And I'll fill in the gaps of what I've done beside, but fast forward, I sold like six figures worth of these things at the 80 country. Our success rate is off the charts of people who bought the materials. I always priced it really inexpensively. So it would never be anything for anybody. And the biggest thing that I always 
said to anyone who bought the materials, you email me anytime or we can have a call anytime. I'm happy to help you. And so anybody run into any situation, they got hundreds and hundreds of emails and answer by your questions because people run into trouble. I mean, the material is terrific, walks them through everything, but scenarios change. I've been doing deals for 30 years. I still learn something in every deal. And I fully automated the business. I put a lot of money into automation and answering emails. I love that. And then got much busier in the buy side representation and sell side representation and was doing that for a number of years. Still looked at some other acquisitions. I bought a legal document preparation company and in total up until that point, I'd made 13 acquisitions and started doing much more M&A and on sell side and buy side because word was getting out there, was getting a lot of calls from buyers and sellers and started doing more representation and, and higher end businesses, more in investment banker type size. Like the ones that are too big for business brokers, too small for investment bankers, like the ones they say are too big to be small, too small to right. be big. And then in 2017, one of my former clients who had become a good friend, he was running his, his family's family office as co-CEO. And it was the Dalio family office. And he had left there and decided he wanted to get into, look to acquire businesses. The Dalio family had hired me in 2007 as a mentor to him to look to acquire businesses. He was based in Florida and his son, Devin Dalio, Neem and I became good friends and ultimately decided not to acquire something. The family office was just starting. They only had a handful of people mm -hmm. and it would be a much greater experience for him to get involved with the family office, which he did and ultimately became co-CEO to Three people think they're probably about 125 people now today. And it's just been the most gratifying work that I've ever done. And I'm um, in a good spot financially and otherwise. And so that, I apologize, took a whole lot of time, but that's my journey. Yeah, we learned a lot during the process too, though. I mean, there's some lessons learned in there. The experience you had and how you ended up in there, it's a little unique to you. It's not like you came straight out of Harvard, went to work for one of the uh, Deloitte. I get a lot of guys on there, not to pick on them, but they came from... Harvard to Deloitte yeah. to doing it on their own. Very logical approach. Yours was more organic. You had a very organic approach to ending up here as opposed to like the scholastic version, which was kind of forced. <laughs> I'm going to go learn this and I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to get it done. Let's talk about, let's kind of jump right into your advice. You've acquired so many companies. You've exited on as many. Let's talk about the buy-in side. Most of our listeners are on the acquisition entrepreneur side. They're making their first few purchases, maybe their first. What are some things that the other people are missing? Like the, you've been doing this longer. You've had material out there for a while. I start right in there with that practical advice. You said you uh, people would usually jump in and into the buying businesses all wrong and never get to buy one. You have a different direction for them. What is the first step in your world to looking at uh, acquiring something? So the first thing, as you touched upon, the... the concept of people and the internet has been the greatest blessing and the biggest curse related to business buyers because you all of a sudden you have hundreds of thousands of businesses for sale and this proliferation of information and a lot of generic information and not useful what have you but it makes it very easy someone thinks about they're interested in buying a business so they jump online and start searching endless business for sale listings and what typically happens they spend hours and days and weeks and months look, looking at listings and they try to figure out which if any is right for them very rarely making any progress, don't get answers from sellers, don't get answers from brokers often. The financial information that they get back, they either don't know how to even read it or it's not, it's not necessarily misrepresented, but when they start digging into things, that's not the actual fact. So the first thing, it's not the actual, the numbers, and that's why so many deals fall apart or don't get done. So the first thing is, like any other major project, the first thing you got to do is, if you don't have the experience, you got to acquire the knowledge. That is step one, real easy. Right. And acquiring it from a, either a good source or a mentor or someone, you know, and someone clearly who has done it before, but acquiring the knowledge to understand what are the steps in the process and what do I need to learn about, whether it be negotiating, valuing a business, due diligence, dealing with brokers, how to search. Something is as, as simple as if I find one of these businesses, how do I contact the seller? Yes, it says press this button to contact the seller, but what am I supposed to say to them? Like I remember early on when I had some engagements, the listing on there, I, I remember once getting an email from someone who says, please send me the last three years of tax. Uh, like, what are you? like, I don't even know you. Shouldn't we first have a conversation? So certain things like knowing what you're supposed to do at that step and be able to send, for example, in that particular case, when you send an inquiry, you're supposed to be telling a broker or seller, I'm interested in your business. I would like to learn more. I'm happy to execute a non-disclosure agreement so you can forward some additional information. Please tell me what your steps are in the process so we can get yeah. going. 
And that is done by probably 1% of the people. And those are the people that start off right versus everybody else who's saying, how are sales this year? Send me the tax returns or start asking them questions related to the number, getting into the weeds. And brokers are inundated. Sellers are inundated. They're just going to totally dismiss that. So number one, without question, is the knowledge. Wherever or however you get it, you got to have the knowledge. The second part is, which is the big piece and the biggest fear that buyers has, have is buying the right business. So it's spending countless hours and days and weeks and months searching business for sales listings, trying to figure out which, if any, are right for you, is the complete inverse of how you're doing. First, you have to figure out what type of business is right for you, and then it's easy to find mm -hmm. and buy it, right? Okay. And there's methodologies to be able to figure out what business is right for you. We did a survey a number of years ago, it was a thousand and four respondents, people who had purchased materials from us. And we asked them a series of questions. What's your biggest concern related to the buying a business? What is a seller's misrepresenting the books, not getting financing, a fear of uncovering problems after it's too late, not knowing how to operate the business. Or number five was finding a business that's right for me. And we asked them to only articulate one is the number, a clear number one choice, not pick three of them or whatever. 74% of the respondents, 74, which is like almost unheard of, said finding the right business for me. So you have this, everybody's concerned about it. No one's doing it about in the right way. So the first thing you have to figure out what's right. And oftentimes it takes looking at 10 different business types. I tell people leverage the business for sale websites as a tool. Ooh. In other words, find four categories that are remotely of interest to you. Contact four or five sellers in each. Then you can look and have conversation with 20 sellers and you'll get a much better insight into the business. You may not buy any of them or be interested in any of them but you'll learn more about that type of business and whether you're not, that business makes sense for you. Because the most important thing is when you're getting a job, it's okay to bullshit your skills a little bit as people do to get the job. But when you're buying a business, it's your money on the line and your future, okay? You can't fool yourself. So you don't want to buy, you have to be very aware of your weaknesses. And the key thing is whatever it is that you do best, it's not the experience, not that you worked in a plumbing business, it's whatever you did, whatever it is, skill you have, whatever it is that you do yeah. best, sales, marketing, management, operations, whatever, has to be the single most important driving factor of the revenue and profits of any business you consider purchasing. So you have to get through that, marry it up with a business. If you marry it up with the right business, you're going to be successful. And the third thing is this concept of people looking for the perfect business. If you want to buy a perfect business, buy a toll booth, right? I have a late friend of mine, Jerry Efros. He was a tail gunner in World War II. And that's what he used to say when people say, what's the best business to buy? He said, buy a toll booth. <laughs> There's no perfect business. It doesn't exist. And if it does exist, you can't afford it. So every business has warts and you have to get past the fact that there's not perfection and keep clicking through to find the perfect business or never being able to be satisfied because every business is going to have problems. You have to just figure out and know how to mitigate those problems and certain problems you just have to live with. And that's the beauty of owning a business because it's not perfect. You can get up every day and figure out how to make it bigger, better, and faster. So those three things of knowledge, acquiring the knowledge and preparation, identifying the types of business that are right for you, for your skill set, and eliminating this idea that you're going to find the perfect business. Those to me, those are the top three. It's, inter three. it's interesting is <clears throat> I went down that route is trying to figure out what I want to do. So... I picked three or four industries, started diving into them. One of the things I knew I wanted to do is eventually buy more of them. So I looked at, I even built a qualification spreadsheet to like, to do weighted scale. And I was looking for industries that had some things that were important to me. So I had about 20 qualifying factors, things that I, I like in businesses. They either have recurring revenue or you can put it in. There's just a list of things that I, they're fragmented. They lend themselves to roll up. So acquiring them. And eventually selling them to a bigger player was an option. So came right. down to like, we did one on marketing agencies. I already knew I didn't want to do that again. It's a very interesting space. But if you start one or buy one small, you're going to run into the same problems they have. You have to sell it to grow it. There's a artificial selling inside of marketing agencies we don't need to get into here. So I knew that one was out. Kind of dove into coffee. And it took me about six months to sign it. Coffee roasting companies, importing and roasting beans right. and selling it. And I don't even like to taste the coffee, but I love the smell of it. I thought, Great business. You already have set clients. If you build a subscription model around it, I'd met a couple of people that had done it, were doing really well. And what turned me off eventually on that was the corruptness in the industry. You're constantly on toes. 
on your tip your toes, making sure you're not dealing with bad players. There's a lot of bad players in the coffee industry. A lot of people don't get it, but U.S. banks are, most of the U.S. banks in the mortgage industry are corrupt as snot. So having dealt with them in the short sale world where I ran an investment firm that bought houses from banks and watched all the dirty tricks they played. And we were turning banks in left and right, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for rules they were breaking. I didn't want to play in another realm where everybody, everybody but you, you're the only one trying to play it honestly. But it's a dirty game. It's part of the nature. So you dive into these and you learn a lot and you think it's the right one, but the stuff you learn, the goal, don't think of it as wasted time. The reason I wanted to bring this up is I didn't think of that as wasted time because everything I learned from that, I took to the other industries I evaluated. Like now I know why I didn't want that. That wasn't even on my checklist. Is this a, a fairly corrupt industry where there's international regulations and other stuff? Like I wouldn't get in the diamond business. You've got one big player and the rest of it, you basically got to play in blood diamonds if you want to like compete against the, what is it, the bear or the bar or whatever they call it. The one thing what you point out through the example that you just mm -hmm. gave is you learned it, right? And you really dove into it. And you just, you didn't say to yourself, well, I think I want to buy a coffee business and this just go running in every which direction mm -hmm. to buy a coffee business. You really dug into the weeds to learn the business, what's involved for whatever reason it didn't match with your interests, your yeah. skill set is immaterial to the equation. You did your diligence, you dug in, you did your research, you gained the knowledge that you needed to gain as to how to go about the process. And you took knowledge from those particular conversations and meetings to the next set of businesses that you potentially look at, which is exactly the original point of gaining the knowledge. And so what happens, you compare and contrast that to a typical buyer, typical buyers. And the only example, the analogy that I could use is you, you prepared, it was like if you were having a race, mm -hmm. right? And all of your, if anybody was doing it the same way as you, everybody prepares for the race. They train, they eat properly. They train properly. Comes a game day or race day, the gun goes off. Everybody's focused and everybody's looking at the finish line versus the typical buyer. What happens is you get to the same starting line and the gun goes off and everybody runs in a different direction. Yeah. yeah I did something a little different. I've never seen a, one of my good friends is a performance coach and I adopted this for me. I mean, never seen a phone number I didn't like. He sees a number, he'll just dial it. I'm not afraid of cold calling. So I literally just start picking up the phone and dialing people in the industry, people who have roasting companies. And it wasn't to see if they wanted to sell their company to me. Basically, it was to say, hey, I'm interested in investing in this industry. Thought about, you know, I might be a competitor in the future, but it's a big enough space for both of us. If you were to start over, would you get back into the space? Why or why not? And then you'd be surprised. Some of them hung up the phone. They didn't have time for me, but good six or eight really decent sized coffee roasting companies talked to me. And I did happen to know two people in the space. Right. I knew somebody that sold theirs and he was one of the religious leaders I know in my life and he sold his and they did distribution. So they brought it in, roasted it, and they basically had trucks that would haul it around and put it in their roast in all the businesses in town. But uh, yeah, you'd be surprised at who will take your call. It's like, Hey, I'm interested in your industry. And Discourage me or encourage me. Either way, I'm okay with either one. I just want to know the honest opinion. And I always go for the, when they say, I would never do this again, X, Y, Z. I go, cool, but what do you like about it? And I get both sides well, of the story. Well, one of the things you said, I would be, you suggested that I would be surprised that how many people, I'm not surprised at all because I've been doing that right. all my life and recommend people. You call trade association, you call yeah. industry experts, you call competitors. If you're looking for that. I don't know, an HVAC company in Redwood City, California, will call an HVAC company in Minneapolis. There'll be some differences, but there's never fear of competition. What surprises me though, is how people do not think that strategy is even possible. Like it just shocked me then. I don't mean to call it ignorance. It's maybe being naive. Maybe it's being afraid that someone's going to hang up the phone on them or tell them to take a hike or whatever the case may be. I'm not surprised that people answer you because people are generally happy to help. And especially you have the odd people that are not nice. I mean, that's rare. I mean, that's the exception. It's not the rule, but people, you call a business owner and they hear that someone else is an aspiring business owner in their industry, they're often they're not going to think it's a competitor. I mean. But I think instantly people put themselves back in time to when they were starting out and wish they had a resource. And people are generally helpful. People are generally nice. People are generally trustworthy. Yep. People are happy to generally happy to see others succeed. But again, what surprises me is that people don't have, seems to be the common sense of looking at a business and saying, hey, how do I go about this in a good way? That's really problematic. And that's the reason why the failure rate is so yep. high is because this practical, real-world approach is not being taken by the majority of people. 
And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Are you an entrepreneur or business owner thinking about your exit strategy? Or maybe you've just landed a business through acquisition and the books just aren't the way you need them to be. Let me tell you about Reconciled, your dedicated partner for industry-leading virtual bookkeeping and accounting services. Reconciled pairs you with skilled professionals who empower you to grow your business and prepare for success, whether that's your exit or taking that new acquisition to top performance. Imagine having high-level financial management without expanding your team. From bookkeeping to CFO services, tax advisory, and even fully outsourced accounting, Reconciled has got you covered. They help you make the best business decisions, keeping your end goal in mind. And the best part? Reconciled understands acquisitions as they have acquired three accounting firms in the past three years, and their founder, Michael Lee, mentors others in searching for acquisition, raising capital, or trying to aggressively scale. Reconcile invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconcile.com today and let them get your books in order. Reconciled, making bookkeeping a breeze. That's Reconcile.com. I'll share one more golden nugget. One of the things I would do is I looked on LinkedIn for these guys or in other places too, but I'd find their profiles if they had any online. And most of the coffee roasting guys had something on LinkedIn. You know, I Google them, they have something on their name. And I start looking what trade associations are they involved in and what volunteer associations. I'm a former, I, I don't participate now because I'm just so busy with kids and everything. But I was a Rotarian for a while. If I seen Kiwanis, Rotarian or anything like that, I know these guys have a giving heart anyway. Or if I see, there's a certain indicator like, man, if I call this guy, he's going to help yeah. me out if he's got time. You can almost tell just yeah. by looking at somebody's profile, what they're engaged in on life, where they're at in their stages and stuff in life. And I'll be honest, most of the time, if somebody's over the age of, say, 60, they've been doing it for 25 years, they're looking for somebody to impart knowledge on because they just don't get that very often. You want to have an interesting conversation, ask somebody to talk about themselves. People love to do it. So tell me about your business. Why did you start it? That's what we always started. Hey, tell me, why did you start this? If you had to do it again, would you start over again? If they gave me the time, there's been times where I'm on the phone for 10 minutes. I've been on the phone with some of these guys for two hours. Yeah, of course. And the trade associations, when we provide people with, here's the resources that you need to dig in. And trade associations are terrific because yeah. they typically have a couple of things. Either they have consultants that advertise right on their websites for right. gigs. And oftentimes you may or may not want to hire the consultant, but consultants are used to, to telling you about their work and themselves and what they can bring to the table in a free venue in a first conversation. So that's just part of their equation. Right. If you get a, a consultant on the phone who's in the industry, we'll be happy to talk to you. So that's one. The second thing is there's, you get a full list of, of companies in that business and very, and it's broken down. So it may be the coffee association, but there could be growers and roasters and retailers and all kinds of, and distributors and manufacturing and packaging companies all related to coffee. So you can pick and choose where it makes sense. And you may want to speak to various ones. And the other one that part of trade association, which is great, very often the boss of the trade association, he or she has been in the business for decades. And very often they founded the association and continued to run it. And it's a quasi organization. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it to help their industry and they're thrilled to help you. All these things are very doable. People are, again, yeah. we talked about this, are happy to help. It's just having the initiative. And sometimes people have the initiative, but they're not sure exactly how to do it. And so that's why the hand holding piece related to the buying process is what separates those who get to the finish line or not. Whether it be knowledge that they have accessible at their fingertips that they've either acquired or they have someone that holds their hand and imparts some experienced advice to them and unbiased advice that helps them get to the finish line. The other thing I did is because uh, some of those reports out there that do in-depth analysis, they're actually expensive, right? They're $25,000, $30,000, $50,000. Yeah. But uh, there's websites out there. The one I'm thinking about is Search Funder. They have the is it IBIS World Industry Reports on a yeah. lot of these industries for free, and they just happen mm -hmm. to have stuff on coffee. And that's a detailed report, something you would have to pay thousands of dollars to get your hands on. And uh, that gave me the ammunition to actually have decent conversations with these guys. Because I wasn't coming in and going to tell me everything. I had already like, hey, I read this on, in a report. This is what I see in the industry. This is what I think I like. Right, and they respect yeah. that. You learned enough to be dangerous, yep. right? Another site that actually is helpful for a lot of people is BizMiner, B-I-Z-M-I-N-E-R, because they'll do a lot of reports, very granular reports of industry, city, location, and a lot of good metrics related to average revenue, what average margin should be, expense percentages for payroll, rent, et cetera. 
a whole lots and lots of metrics and very valuable. And again, everything we keep talking about keeps coming back to the same thing, which is educate yep. yourself. And if you're not going to get educated, the chances are you're not going to get to the finish line. It's just that simple. This is infinitely more complicated than buying a house. I forget who it was. It might, might have been a broker we were talking to or whatever. We were laughing one time. See, people typically spend more time researching buying yearling tickets and planning vacations than they do preparing to buy a business. And it's true. I mean, it's they figure out, okay, how hard could it be? And don't confuse how hard the process could be. Like most people, they may be capable of running the business, but buying the business is a whole different set of skill set. And oftentimes an individual's only comparison is when they may or may not have bought real property. And so they get the, the agents in that industry may or may not be better, but the things that have to be done related to a property, my wife runs a title agency, title business. And what she does at closing on a transaction, let's say her checklist is a hundred things. And that could vary plus or minus a few percentage points from one transaction to the other. When you're acquiring a business, you may say you have that same hundred point checklist, but it differs every single time. And so the only comparison very often people have is when they bought property. So they went to see someone, the owner showed them around, they went and got an inspector who told them everything that's good or bad about the property. They went to the bank and the bank said, oh yeah, you got all these bricks, we'll lend you money. They got a mortgage and they get to a closing and none of that applies. Banks don't financing. No one's doing the inspection except you. Sellers aren't helping you. If you don't ask them the question, they're not telling you. Neither is anybody on the other side. And the checklist is completely different. So the point of comparison that people have to what this business buying process looks like is just an inaccurate, it's inaccurate context. And I get it. I understand it. So hopefully people make the, come to that conclusion pretty quickly before getting frustrated because if buying a business is not difficult. I mean, I went to two years of community college. I didn't go to college. I mean, it's just all learning on the streets and learning and doing. So buying a business is not difficult, but it's complicated. So again, it's not difficult. It's complicated. Anybody could do it. Just have to prepare properly and learn, right? And know how to do things. If you buy the wrong real estate, Time heals every real estate error. So if you buy the wrong real estate, as long as you can service the debt and hold out, you're going to be okay. You know, you buy the wrong business, you're bankrupt yep. in a year. I get that. And I always joke around, tell people I have more education than the average fool should have. I've got multiple <laughs> degrees. And at one point in my life, I thought I wanted to retire to be a college professor. Then I did some adjunct professoring and realized I don't like snotty nose kids and mommy and daddy's paying their way through college. But let's go, so we covered the first three things that you're talking about there, making sure that you educate yourself, you know what business you're looking for. Now they've done the prep right. So what is the next step? Do you like broker deals and on-market deals? Real quick, before we go to that realm. One of the things I also learned doing this podcast actually was you were talking about don't expect a perfect business. I was turning businesses away left and right, probably passed some really good deals up because we were looking at quite a few at the beginning because I was trying to figure out where I wanted to be. At first, it was like anything profitable. That said, one of the things that somebody said to me is like, where do you expect the financials? Like, why are you expecting these small business owners under $5 million purchase price to have perfect financials if they don't have a broker that cleaned them up? I was like, because I only know how to read perfect financials. I'm not a forensic CPA. You get better reading the financials or bring somebody in to do it for you, but don't expect them to have it. They're not going to. You're going to walk past good deal after good deal after good deal because you expect a perfect balance sheet, profits, loss statement, and cash flow analysis, which none of them have, right? No, they're not going to have that, but it doesn't mean it's a bad business and it doesn't mean that the financials are not in good order. What they just need to be is beefed up a little bit. Often they're using QuickBooks. They're managing their business from the financial standpoint that makes sense for their business. And some of them don't even, even do monthly statements and maybe there's a lack of sophistication and that's okay. And interestingly enough, in the smaller end of deals, 50% of the deals fall apart in due diligence because the numbers that were representative simply don't match up. Where you went wrong with those and what you seem to readily admit is you were too neurotic about these perfect financials versus saying, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to either make sense of the financials or they're not. And that's why I tell people before you start hiring accountants to do your due diligence, get a hold of all the financials because if they don't make sense to you, they're not going to make sense to your account and sort of look in and see what's needed. And oftentimes you could reconstruct it and there's a, as long as there's a paper trail and it's infinitely easier today than it was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, because so many people are paying by credit card and debit card or, or online. And so there's always a trail. The one thing is where people run into danger is the so-called fatuation with cash businesses, which is a crocker ship, excuse yeah. my language. Because first of all, it's illegal. Number one, number two, if the seller can't prove it, you can't pay for it. 
Number three, it's short-sightedness to run a business and take cash out of it. Because for example, if you're buying a business and the seller gives you like the week, by the way, we take out $100,000 in cash out of the business. That doesn't mean they're taking out $100,000 of cash and putting it in their pocket. As I said before, if they can't prove it, you can't pay for it. But they're probably paying a couple of employees by cash or they're buying certain raw materials or inventory or desks or computers for cash to offset it. And so it's not $100,000. And again, if you can't prove it, you can't pay for it. But if you get back to the site, idea related to the financials, you got a QuickBooks package. You're going to be able to look at it and be able to look at it with your accountant and you make sense with it. And you'll have a lot of questions and questions typically beget more questions. But again, where you ran into trouble is stuck in a drop down to point number three of the perfect business mm -hmm. where you're expecting a perfect scenario and it just doesn't happen. They're small yep. businesses and often they're run well to the extent of what the business is. But because they don't have good books and records doesn't make them bad businesses. On my intermediary side, I often spend a six months to a year with a business owner getting their business ready for sale. And that oftentimes includes getting the books and records in real good order to be able to present them properly. I think your earlier question was related to brokers or sellers. Was it related to disclosing information or being an impediment? No, I'm just curious of like, if you're new, brokers present a better picture, but often it's not a fully true and honest picture. So you still got to have a thick skin enough and a BS meter enough to go, wait a second, something's not right here. But you are going to get cleaned up, especially if they're working with an advising broker, somebody that has some skills to do some cleanup beforehand to where if you go totally off market, a lot of the off market deals I've looked at, their finances are, I hand my receipts right. over every quarter to my accountant. She does my taxes and other than that, I've got it in a spreadsheet. I've been given Excel spreadsheets with accounts payable and accounts receivable. They didn't even have QuickBooks, yeah. especially small pest control, small home service yeah. businesses. They don't have QuickBooks. They don't have, it's yeah. never needed. In 25 years of running it, they didn't need it. It didn't exist when they started and there was no reason to change the way they'd run running. And I understand that and respect it. But on the other side of the equation of looking at buyers, they do have to put that into place to make it sellable. So I know the earlier question is, as you were mm -hmm. talking triggered that, which was looking at businesses that are handled by buyers or brokers or off market or whatever. And my perspective on that is I like them all. So I think starting off early on, the resource of the business for sale websites is very good for you to make some mistakes and you can pose some questions yeah. and give you a flavor for looking at business, get some idea of valuation and get your feet going a little bit in the process. Once you start yeah, contact all the brokers. There's some good ones. There's some awful ones. And so what, right? Like in every industry and some are helpful and some are not, but the broker are going to be some much better brokers who will do some of the things that you said they do. Brokers used for three things from a buyer's perspective. They can help you gain access to businesses for sale because they have listings. They can act as a buffer between you and the seller in case they have to deliver any bad news because the sellers are probably going to be training you. So you want to maintain a good relationship. And the third thing is they've done it before and they know the documentation yeah. paperwork that's necessary to get it to the finish line. They're not going to dispense unbiased advice. They're not going to do anything to jeopardize the deal. They're going to put together the numbers in the best way possible. Some of them are, will do a better job. Some of them do a worse job. Other ones are going to be complete and transparent. Other ones are putting lipstick on a pig. And you know what? It all doesn't matter because you have to do your research yourself. And so when you investigate it and if something doesn't seem right or you're asking questions, it really doesn't matter what they say or what they tell you or how they present it because it's up to you. The onus is on you to diligence it, yep. right? I mean, if you do it the right way, you'll uncover every problem, no matter what they've done. For example, the big thing is owner benefits, seller's discretionary earnings or seller's cash flow with all these ad backs. When you go into these websites and everyone has a different terminology, so you first have to make sure they're talking about the same thing. But the first question is, is well, just tell me what's in that number. Let's start with that. You're representing the seller's discretionary earnings or owner benefits, whatever the heck they call it. Terminology varies. It's $250,000. Well, tell me what's in it. And if, as long as what you're doing most is, for example, you find out there's a $150,000 add back for depreciation. Okay. And people, you don't know what you're doing. It sounds right to you. Well, what happens if you go to buy equipment in three years? You're going to need a capital expenditure allowance to reduce the depreciation, right? Or certain things like the lad back cell phones and trips and vacation. Well, if it's personal, that's fine. But if you need the cell phone to run the business, you can't add back your cell phone or their truck. Well, the truck's making deliveries. Right. We can't add the truck. So all these type of things is through just asking the right questions. And it's like you listen to everything the broker and the seller yeah. tells you. You take great notes. It's wonderful if you could like and trust them.
but you have to validate right. everything. And it's a very good perspective from a buyer is you want to form a nice relationship with the seller because you want to get their guard down. You never want to let yours down, but you want to get their guard down. And everything they tell you, they're trying to sell you. Their goal is to sell you. You want to get to buy a car dealership. They may be the nicest guy or lady on the planet, a salesperson there, but they want to sell you the car. Make no mistake. So that's their agenda. You have to verify it. I walked into a friend calls me and says, hey, my grandparents is about time they sell their company. Would you come take a look at it with me? I was like, all right. So I go over there with him and not to present myself as a broker or buyer. I mean, not even the buyer of that, but they knew what I did and what I was in. And the interesting thing was I said, hey, he's like, well, can you tell me a rough estimate of what my business is worth? I was like, can I see your financials? He's like, sure. He walks me into a room. I'm not kidding. Walks me into a room and it's just filled with file cabinets, like big, tall file cabinets. And he pulls out these notebooks that are green, like these green <laughs> notebooks. And I'm thinking, oh my God. And then I started looking around. I, there was not a computer in this manufacturing plan. And they had a computerized Wang, like green screen Wang computer that did their time card, but nothing else that had computers. And his accounting was on those old accounting notebooks that they used to keep. And I was like, okay. I was like, do you have a balance statement? And he pulls out the right one to show me. It was the cleanest damn thing I ever seen in my life. Some of those businesses represent phenomenal opportunities. Just yeah. because they do it a certain way doesn't mean it's the wrong way. Okay. Yeah. It and works I, for that business. And, and I often, told him, I said, this is the cleanest financials I've seen in a long time. He goes, it should be my wife's a CPA. They were in their late sixties, early seventies. This is the way they'd always done it. I had a kind of a distaste from computers, never needed them. And this was working for them. So where people run into trouble, for example, in that exact scenario, a buyer goes in, they've seen three or four other businesses. Now this individual has the financials, which are pristine. <laughs> They're just not logically advanced or in QuickBooks. And they tell their, they see three other companies, they immediately draw the conclusion that the business is in disarray, or they tell their, start talking to their accountant, the accountant says, tell them to email me the QuickBooks files. Well, there's no QuickBook files. What do you mean? Well, they're on, they're handwritten. Those are, you can't buy a business like that. Well, of course you can, but you're yeah. getting all the wrong advice and you're drawing all the wrong conclusions. And sometimes those businesses, those businesses represent these tremendous opportunities because you could imagine if they haven't automated that part of the business. There's probably other areas that they haven't automated or those businesses. What you see frequently is the parts of the business that are really not the core business. They haven't paid any attention to. It's not in this array, but they haven't paid attention to, but oftentimes you meet someone like in that case, that individual could be one of the most foremost authorities on manufacturing of that particular product because that's what they know. That's what they focus on. And you know what? That's what keeps the cash register chinging. So that's what's important. And they're usually, not always, but they're usually terrific opportunities. They weren't ready, quite ready to sell. They just wanted like, what is it going to look like to sell? Two things I told them, if we can only focus on two things, what would it be? Here's what I told them. I'm hoping I was right. I say, bring your books back in, get QuickBooks, get some type of accounting program, bring them in because the buyers are going to want to see it and you'll get more buyers to look at it because they're going to look online. What you want them to do right at this stage is let your wife do it exactly what she's doing. Their job is to put all that data for at least the last three to five years into the computer system and just keep up the speed with her. Don't change anything because it's done well. I'm sure that a forensic accounting, I'm not an accountant by any means, but I, I don't do it as well as you're doing now, but just have somebody keep up with your wife. And the second thing I said is the same thing you just said. Like everything you do here is in your head. This guy would go out and maintain his own machine work out there. And I said, you got to get standard operating procedures in place for things. So start getting knowledge out of your head, have somebody walk around and take notes of what you're doing when you're doing your maintenance, when you're doing your stuff, that stuff's all got to be documented because the next guy is the next operator is not going to be as senior as you. And people don't understand in the sales process. So if they get the right intermediary, they'll help them through that and get it prepared. Yep. And no yep. large part, the numbers, if you take a look at the business brokerage world on the business for sale website or typical Main Street USA businesses, it's reported that 75% of the businesses that go to market don't sell. And it's for all of those reasons and preparation and what have you. And it's pretty, pretty easy to do as far as the preparation is concerned. The buyers that are budding entrepreneurs that are listening, it's a very good lesson. And I hope a lot of them take these experiences of visiting businesses and all these examples that we've given, because there's a real good lesson in, in all of this, which is run your business like you have to sell it. And so from the time they start, all the pain points that they had going through the process, and they finally got through to the finish line and acquired a business. So you can't just stop thinking about what a mess the business for sale market is 
because you should use that to your advantage and say, hey, the time is going to come. Everybody sells their business, right? Yes, Everybody yeah. exits one way or the other. Yeah. yeah. So whenever there's an exit going to take place. And so if you make the business easy to sell, and by that, I don't mean pricing it inexpensively. You make it easy for someone to buy. You've got process and procedure. And one of the ways, one of the questions that I love to tell buyers that they should be asking sellers, because there's about 36 key questions that you got to ask at every seller. But a couple of them are, for example, is what happens if you get hit by a Pepsi truck tomorrow? Number one. Number two, what keeps you up at night about the business, right? And if they tell you nothing keeps up about business, they're full of crap because everybody, if you own a business, something keeps you up at night about the business. And the third thing is, which is a very disarming question, and people, sellers don't realize what is actually being asked is, how much vacation do you take a year? And right. the reason why that's really important is because you're going to get a tremendous insight to the landscape of the business. If you get someone who takes a lot of vacation during the year and has a successful business, means the business runs very well without them. They got a good team in place and they got policies and procedures. If they tell you, I don't take any vacation, it's either one of two things. Either the business is all them or they haven't put any process or procedures into place. They micromanage the business and there's an opportunity for you to allow people to grow as employees if you take over the business. So you have those three questions, which I find very helpful to, again, for buyers. Another thing that buyers need to pay attention to in those type of things with policies and procedures or what's really happened, because the seller will tell you, Joan, she takes care of everything. You got nothing to worry about. But a good way to measure that, when, that's why I like to have the meetings at the business's location during business hours. Because if the seller can't have a meeting for an hour or two hours without being interrupted several times by the employees with questions, you know that everything goes through him or her. And that's yep. not the way you want to build a business. No matter what the size is, you have to empower your employees to do their job, do it well, and put the procedures in place to make that happen. So again, they might be things that one buyer looks at and says, shoot, guy doesn't take any vacation. Or if something happens to them, the business evaporates tomorrow or says nothing keeps him up at night. And we know that's nonsense. Or it could be the buyer number two looks at that and says, hey, this is a tremendous opportunity. Right? They got a good product, whatever. If they would just put some of these systems into place, or the seller is probably the one preventing the growth, it's really in the eyes the way you look at it. And proper knowledge, education, and training is how you are able to put on those lenses to be able to see beyond what's just at face value and make these and take advantage of some of these opportunities. A lot of people don't realize that, like we were in that, that particular one. Then one of the things I did notice is I couldn't carry on a five minute conversation without somebody needing something from them. Like yeah. every five, 10 minutes, somebody was in his office. Yeah. And uh, that's how I knew you had to have standard operating procedures and he needed to like distance himself some from it. Cause like that, there's something to be said that. And then I got to talk to one of the employees there because like I'm friends with their grandchild. And he said, he's the worst micromanager I've ever met in my life. And I said, the company can't sell that way because even if there were standard operating procedures and everything else, when somebody hires somebody and they, the only people that work at a place that's been micromanaged for the last 30 years are people who need to be micromanaged. You need to be micromanaged. You got the wrong people. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. And I've done this in business. I surrounded myself with the wrong people in business once or twice before in my life. And to fulfill my own needs, like when it clicked, you're like, wait a second, I love to solve problems. So one of the things I consider myself is a really good problem solver. So I had a business for a little while where that I didn't think some of my employees could tie their shoes unless I showed them how to do it. One time the first time, and then they wouldn't bring that back to me. But Oh, there's a knot on my shoelace now. How do I undo the knot? And you had to teach them everything at least once. And it clicked in my head is I positioned myself in a company where everybody that's working with me, they needs me. And I don't need to feel needed anymore. I need these guys to do the daggum job without yeah, well, me. You know, you yeah. come older and your ego goes yep. away. I mean, the biggest evolution in my business career. And at the beginning, it was probably insecurity or what have you. And I recognize that is when I started hiring people that are the bigger, better, faster, and a hell of a lot smarter than I am. And a lot of it, again, probably has to do with the ego and security. The way I look at it right now is, and the way sellers sh should look at it is, again, this is just my personal feelings. If I'm the smartest guy in the room, I'm in the wrong room. I don't want to be the smartest guy. And so again, business owners, they have a tendency, some of them, they micromanage. You see all that, but it really all comes back to a lot of this, when we're talking about these scenarios where people come across, and you and I both have probably oodles of war stories of these examples, is you come across all these type of sellers, owners, different ones. You walk down the street from that particular owner and the next person has great procedures in place, second tier of management. They don't have to be there. They take six, eight, 10 weeks vacation year. I have one client who takes a hundred days of vacation a year. They exist. So you can't get discouraged at the time possible 
and having surrounding yourself with the right people if you have to go to them for questions. Because all of these scenarios, that's the beauty of what you and I do, because every situation is so different. And so it, as long as you know how to handle it, sometimes the greatest opportunities, that business that I told you about early on that I, it was a hundred grand and I couldn't afford it and end up working on a deal with the owner, we turned it into a four and a half, four and a half million dollar company with ridiculous profits. And I could list out 50 reasons why I should never buy that business. And I could list out one reason that I knew why I should buy it. And that was, I mean, their books and records were disarray. Their technology was old. Some other people weren't even showing up to work, but they had a tech, one part of their technology, which was really impressive and could, and could be exploded. So you had all these things, one side of the ledger, 50 things at least that would tell you why I shouldn't buy the business. But the one side of the other business was I knew that particular business would dovetail perfectly into my company. And there was a tremendous roll-up opportunity because the service was going to be required more and more frequently by retailers as they lowered their store personnel count. I knew without question and complete conviction, even though I could have been wrong at that point in time, I really felt that I knew that this was going to be a tremendous path for the next several years. And it's something that I can build upon. I like that. What one or two things with all absolute certainty that you can improve upon in the business. Yeah. That's something we should always identify is like, I look at like content sites and newsletters and stuff. And a lot of times I just look at it. Like there's some things I like just at the first glance, you go, I know absolutely positively a hundred percent. I can do X, Y, and Z to this and improve it. Yes. Right? And oftentimes when you talk about small business buyers, they don't have the experience of having owned any businesses or any upper level management position. Potentially they know they have a few bucks. They want to buy a business. They want to get something. But what happens is when you go through this process properly and you're looking at a bunch of different businesses, you take something away from every conversation and discussion. And when you go meet with a seller in a business that's completely foreign to you today, and you do start doing research and every question you have begets more questions and one place leads to another, you start doing more research. It's amazing what you're able to extract from your knowledge that you've acquired in a very short period of time, you were looking at a plumbing supply business. Now you're looking at a pest control business. And the next thing you're looking at is a property management company. And it's amazing. Like a Venn diagram has an overlap. It's amazing mm. how much overlap there is and what you can pull from one and what thing, what you learned in one can be applied to the other. And you just get smarter as you go. Yeah. Well, we're over on time here. I think we're having a great okay. conversation and stuff. So how would you like to wrap this up? If somebody could remember two or three things from today's show, what would you want them to remember? It's a great question. So from a buy side, clearly is take the time and I'm not giving anyone a sales pitch for the materials or information to provide it. You've got to get knowledgeable, whatever it takes, however it is, you've got to get knowledgeable before you jump into it because the statistics are against you, right? 90 plus percent fail in our business. We're a little better. 82% of our clients have bought a business in six months. We're slightly better than that. They're hell of a lot better, right? But prepare, there's lots of good information. Align yourself with the right people, get good information before you jump in to start looking at businesses, really educate yourself. The other thing is understand that this takes time. This is the ultimate marathon and not a sprint. The average business from the time a business is listed until it sells is nine months in the smaller category. It's going to take you in a perfect scenario. It's going to take you six months to buy a business. It's going to be four months of looking, a month to negotiate and investigate and a month of due diligence. So it's going to take you six months. It doesn't happen overnight. Don't spend this ridiculous amount of time just searching endless business for sale listings. Top of the list, if you want to educate yourself and that's perpetual, is meet with a bunch of different businesses until you can figure out exactly whatever skill set that you have marries perfect to that type of business. And then you really begin your search in earnest and you can go off market and there's good ways to do it. And don't get discouraged. A lot of deals fall apart. You're going to meet all kinds of people, but you meet mostly nice people and the onus is on you and everything. This is very doable. So uh, Richard Parker, richardparker.com. Thank you for being on the show. Great information today. Hang out for a second afterwards and we'll call that a show. Thanks again. Pleasure being here. Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show. Ask questions, uh, suggest a guest, or even tell me about a business you have for sale and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline and leave us some information. Thank you.
I don't want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace we have partnered with has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now